Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who is watching our video. My name is Alexander Kraputsky. I'm a partner at the external office from Belarus and one of the co-chair of the organizing committee of the Eastern European Dispute Resolution Forum. Our guest is Ms. Solomon, Jamie Solomon. Welcome. Lovely Thank you so much you for having me. Lovely to have you today. It is a big honor for us to have an interview with you. And uh, I have to mention that you are the first woman president of the ICC court in its almost 100 year history. Congratulations. Thank you so much. And I take office July 1st. So uh, there are still a few more months of Alexei Moore's term. And I know he's going to achieve uh, significant additional um, initiatives uh, as his term uh, continues. Let me start our first Eastern European Dispute Resolution Forum quick and honest interview with Claudia Solomon. Our issue for discussion is international arbitration with a client mindset. During preparation for this interview, I asked myself a question, which also would like address to you. What is client mindset? And in other words, what clients wishes and what are the expectations from international arbitration? For myself, I compare I am our potential client with a patient who applied to the doctor and our client doesn't want to hear everything what doctor learned for many, many years. The task of patient, our client is very simple. To take care as soon as possible and at cheapest price. Potentially clients have the same expectation from international arbitration. Would you agree? I do agree. Uh, the legal market went through a huge transformation over the last 25 years to focus on client service. And it is high time for the international arbitration community to do the same, to be focused on what the parties in an international arbitration actually want, because the parties are actually the clients of the arbitral institutions and in essence, the clients of the arbitrators. I think the term users itself is so antiquated. It also uh, suggests something that's very temporary. You use it and you discard it. Uh, it doesn't create a connection and a relationship between those who are involved in arbitration and the actual parties in the arbitration whose arbitration it is. Thank you. You had experience in commercial arbitration all over Europe. What is the main difference between clients from West and East? Well, I would say, you know, when I've had clients from uh, West Coast of the United States, uh, they have truly said to me, if your email is more than four lines, uh, it's unlikely to be read. Uh, but clients, uh, especially in Asia, uh, in my experience, have wanted uh, very detailed explanations about uh, all of the issues that could arise in an arbitration and to really play out how the scenarios could play out. We will come back to this issue later on. Uh, my next question uh, I call grandmother test. Uh, and uh, I really hope that you will allow us to leave in our video uh, information that one of your grandmothers emigrated from Belarus to the United States. And I have to mention that many, many practitioners uh, in arbitration world right now, they're from Belarus. So it's very interesting. And uh, let's return to grandfather test. Uh, if you cannot explain difficult legal issues to your grandma, you will not be able to win a case. How to explain difficult issues of the case to your client? Uh, well, first, let me say, yes, my grandmother, one of my grandmothers was born in Minsk in 1907 uh, and uh, emigrated to the United States when she was a little girl as um, part of a very large wave of immigrants that came from Eastern Europe to the United States. Uh, 
And so the analogy you use of explaining something to your grandmother, I think is very apt and one I use as well. Uh, it's something that uh, the new president of the United States, Biden, has uh, said uh, publicly uh, as the way he wants to get advice from his advisors. If this isn't something that you could explain to your grandmother, or your mother, as it were, then uh, you need to come back and start again. And for me, I think that's a tool that I have really tried to instill, especially for young practitioners uh, who are trying to grapple with using legalese and legal terminology. And at the end of the day, they often need to just start again and say, and we say, what is this case about? And what is the issue that has to be decided? And if you can explain those essential elements, then you can build your argument. I fully support and agree. One of the ICC training course was named for business professionals on how to get the most from international commercial arbitration. In your opinion, what steps and when clients shall make to get the most out of arbitration? I think clients should stay involved. It, an international arbitration is not something that they should just hand off to outside counsel and uh, wash their hands and then be frustrated with the process. Uh, there are so many ways in which in-house counsel or business leaders, if they don't have in-house counsel, can stay connected to the arbitration. At the basic level, they can be copied on all emails from the arbitral institution and the tribunal itself. Uh, then they know in real time what is happening. Uh, In-house counsel and the clients themselves are the best uh, assessors of risk and the best assessors of what they're willing to do in the arbitration process. Uh, they're also the best assessors in many instances of how strong witnesses may actually be because they have an understanding of the business. And that deep understanding needs to become uh, even more integrated into the arbitration process for clients' perspectives to be uh, understood and for clients to be satisfied with the process. Thank you. What are the key issues in choosing of arbitration institute and what is necessary to take into account when you explain it to your client? Well, you know, as the new uh, and next president of the ICC uh, court, uh, you can be sure that uh, my recommendation would only be one, which is uh, to choose ICC arbitration regardless of your dispute. Uh, but why? Uh, and why have I been so connected to ICC for most of my career? It is because I actually really believe in what ICC uh, uh, is doing and its mission, which is to be and is the truly uh, global arbitral institution, uh, not tied to any geography or the whims of, pol uh, of politics, to be able to resolve a dispute uh, between parties wherever they are, uh, with whatever language uh, they want the arbitration to be in, uh, wherever the arbitration is to take place. At the end of the day, one is only in an arbitration and needs an arbitral institution when there is a crisis. And so assuring that you have the gold standard, that there is uh, quality and client service is, is core. Of course, as a member of the ICC court currently, I have to support that it will be really <laughs> Excellent. good for clients. Another issue, uh, which is also very important for clients, what uh, are the most important things need to be taken into consideration when you choose an arbitrator? In some cases, the client just cannot accept that the arbitrator will be a star with necessity to pay a huge advance for his or her involvement as an arbitrator. The qualities one needs in an arbitrator really depends on the case. Uh, it is so case by case specific. Uh, the best arbitrator for one matter is not the right arbitrator for another matter. So 
when I was counsel, I always, uh, at the start of a case or when we were considering the appointment of an arbitrator, always set out the qualities we were seeking and then began to rank those qualities, looking at uh, nationality, background, uh, governing law experience, uh, sector experience, uh, perspective, uh, and then uh, significantly uh, assuring that we were thinking outside of the box, not just the usual players, and in other words, to make sure that we were uh, broadly considering a diverse range of candidates. And then uh, going through that process, we really would rank uh, arbitrators and come uh, to the choice that we had for that particular case. But again, just to emphasize, it's so case by case specific. Yeah, I fully agree. And uh, in such cases, I use comparison that you can use uh, Subway or you can use Bentley. <laughs> what do you think about document production procedure? Is it necessary and very effective tool or it serves only like tradition from English law? And from the same point of view, what about cross-examination of, of witnesses and experts? I know lawyers often uh, provide all of their answers with, it depends, but an aspect of international arbitration is that it, the process is so tailored for the particular case. And so in my mind, I answer your question with, it depends, to say that um, each case is different. It depends on whether there is an, a real need for exchange of information. Uh, it depends on what type of witnesses have been submitted and whether the parties do seek to cross-examine them. And so, um, each arbitrator should approach an arbitration and counsel should approach arbitration to consider what are the needs of the case uh, and then address those specific needs. In one of your interviews, you have mentioned that while studying at the Oxford University, after reading one of your paper, David Butler has said, the British spent more time on the first sentences than the Americans do. In your opinion, to what extent introduction and first sentence are important in real case? I consider the first sentence to be so significant. So after that experience many decades ago, I always focus on the key first sentence. A theme sets the tone. It, it's as a case is evolving uh, it's important for counsel to be focused on their theme and that first sentence describes the theme and communicates what counsel wants the arbitrators to think about as the essence of the issue to be decided in the case. A theme is not the same as the legal issue to be decided. Uh, uh, I've mentioned that one of my first appellate arguments was a pro bono case involving a prisoner who sought to have a hernia operation. And for me, the, the legal question was, was that denial of a hernia operation a denial of uh, or constituted cruel and unusual punishment under the Eighth Amendment of the United States Constitution? The first sentence of my oral argument was, this is a case about pain. And that is what I wanted the judges to think about in that context. Yes, and uh, my next question uh, really connected to previous question and uh, what you already said. One of the famous Russian advocates, Fyodor Klivaka, unfortunately he was not practicing international arbitration, during our period of time, possessed an extraordinary acting talent. Each of his speech was like a theater action. At the end of one of his speech, he said, if my client is innocent, then the Lord will give a sign of that. And just in that moment, the bells on the church rang. Hmm. Do you support that international arbitration is theater and councils are actors in this theater? 
and how to impress the arbitral tribunal. And uh, is it necessary to impress at all? Or most important is to focus on, le on legal issues and facts. Yeah. One of my early mentors uh, had a theater background and he did liken litigation and arbitration to theater. Only the lawyers were uh, the prop designers, uh, the set designers in, in many instances, uh, costume designers, uh, script writers, uh, and, uh, and actors. Uh, and not to take things too lightly, uh, but in essence, one is thinking about presentation. That is the role of an advocate, uh, to think about uh, what is going to be most effective to the decision makers. Uh, and sometimes in an arbitration hearing, I do think when witnesses come in and out of the room, it's like an actor entering stage left and exiting stage right. Uh, uh, that said, one of the interesting things about virtual hearings is that the setting, the stage as it were, has changed. And it means that some of the usual props and methods for being effective are no longer there. Everyone is a square as it were. And so we, it can be a great equalizer. And it's something that enables uh, I believe many people to be effective advocates because we are then getting down to the essence of what is being argued and what has to be decided. Yes, and again, probably we can say it depends. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> you are familiar with Eastern Europe. You spent three years in Prague. My question with regard to the Prague rules, what do you think about the necessity and role for international arbitration? Uh, the Prague rules are another tool, another process the parties can use when trying to resolve their dispute. They have arisen out of a frustration that some parties, some practitioners had with the IBA rules. Uh, so I'm all in favor of parties and participants in arbitration coming up with new ways to think about uh, resolving their dispute in a way that makes them feel comfortable and meets their needs. And so if it is a tool that uh, the parties seek to use, I'm absolutely in favor of it. Many of arbitration practitioners agree that efficiency depends on how parties and their councils act, in particular volume of submissions, call for witnesses, cross-examination, etc. What do you think about proactive role of the arbitral tribunal in conducting other proceedings and its contribution into efficiency? There's an important role for arbitrators to raise issues about the way in which a dispute can be resolved efficiently without hijacking the arbitration process away from the parties. But in my experience as counsel and as arbitrator, uh, when a dispute arises, it is often very difficult for the parties to reach agreement on the process of the arbitration too, uh, because everybody views the process as strategically beneficial if it uh, runs one way or the other. A party that wanted, can talk about reducing time and costs may want an arbitration to be very expensive and very lengthy once an arbitration starts. So the tribunal does have an important role to manage the process and raise ways in which a dispute can be resolved more efficiently than the parties may consider, or if the parties can't reach agreement as how to, uh, in a way to do that. Thank you very much. So let me now address you the 10 questions that will require brief answers 
in 10 seconds maximum. You're Great, ready? I'm ready. Okay, the first question. Do you agree that international arbitration is the game only for big and wealthy company like five-star hotels? First, an international arbitration is definitely not a game and it is definitely not limited to uh, big players. Thank you. Uh, second question, is international arbitration the place for arbitration specialists where anyone can participate in this process? An international arbitration should be a method for resolving a dispute uh, for any party. And uh, counsel, even if they don't have experience with international arbitration, should be able to represent their clients well in the process. The next question, what goal hangs over? The goal to win? or the goal to settle the dispute as soon as possible? My experience is clients have many different goals uh, when a dispute arises, and it is essential for counsel to understand what the client's objectives is, are in an international arbitration. Thank you very much. Uh, what approach do you prefer when appointing an arbitrator? The star, the newcomer, as me, for example, or the very experienced but old? Every arbitration is different, and we have to find the arbitrator that is right for the specific case. It depends. It depends. <laughs> The next question, is mediation a good tool for international arbitration? Mediation can be an essential tool to resolve a dispute when the parties are at a point when they're able to assess risk and costs. The next question, can you name three things that clients mostly like or mostly hate? when resolve disputes in international commercial arbitration? Clients want or like uh, or expect uh, arbitrators to uh, consider their case, the legal issues and the evidence. They expect the time and cost to be commensurate with the amount in dispute and they expect to have an understanding of the process. And they hate to pay money. And they hate to have uncertainty and uh, have surprises in the international arbitration. I agree. Do you agree that in most of cases, witness to submissions are more counsel submissions? When witness submissions are counsel submissions, it's very apparent. The next question, would you favor the use of hearings on preliminary issues to save time and expenses? I do believe that consideration of preliminary issues, and by that I mean uh, legal issues that can resolve a significant portion of the case can be an effective tool. Uh, and so it is important to assess that at the very start of the case. And a hearing, meaning either oral argument uh, virtually or in person may or may not be necessary. Uh, those issues could be submitted on the papers or a hearing oral argument can be uh, either by telephone or uh, by video conference. In your opinion, what is better, having long or short opening statement speech? I think opening statements should focus on the issues in dispute and usually lengthy uh, descriptions of context uh, are not helpful. The last question, would you agree that international arbitration is still lacks cultural and gender diversity? There has been significant uh, increase of diversity in international arbitration, but we have a long way to go. 
with Ms. Salomon. Thank you very much for this very interesting, quick and honest interview. Thank you.